Hey everybody, it's Jane Johnston with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Commosive and host of Vancouver Island Time. Today we are here on He Said, She Said, They Said with Andrew Plank. Welcome, Andrew. Hey everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, Ray? Goody. Eh? You're looking pretty Canadian, eh? Thanks, eh? <laughs> so, uh... How how uh, how are you enjoying daylight savings time? Oh yeah, right. <laughs> we're, we're talking about this before the the thing. And she says, "I don't talk about it." <laughs> I, I, don't do really it. I don't think we should do it. I think it's it's too hard for people changing circadian rhythm, and uh, it's, it's kind of pointless to me. Uh, I, I I think we just pick pick a plan and stick with it. Right. Um, and are you going to talk about it now? Because <laughs> you said you didn't talk about it. Uh, no, I just realized something. So uh, I find, like, when I was a kid, that it really was hard. Oh, not when I was a kid, but when I had kids, um, that it wasn't easy because I would have to start thinking about changing their time of bed till one hour earlier or later about a week ahead of time so it would always i would always be like trying to manage it 15 minutes over four days okay well that's really wise we didn't do that and then that caused of course the abruptness of uh, you know they're either not getting up on time or they're up too early for kids that's uh it's pretty hard to tell kids what clock means when they're really young and uh they just are going to do their own thing <laughs> they have their own internal clocks and there's no changing those twice a year Okay, but funny story though was today I actually woke up at nine thirty, <laughs> thinking it was eight thirty. <laughs> what? So you just got up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Because it's like, is it backwards? Is it forwards? A uh, spring ahead, fall back. You always got to go through the thing. Yeah. I'm sure some people know this, but I'm sweating. See, <laughs> <laughs> am I? <laughs> it looks hot there though. You got some sunshine. I was just, um, I sent a client a little uh, um, note update on a property they were asking about and it also happened to be their three year anniversary today of the purchase of their other home. And so I sent them a little note this morning. They live up on Bear Mountain. They said they had snow this morning. Yeah. Get out of town. I'm in town and I'm not leaving. <laughs> Well, I didn't see frost. That's it. So the reason why I slept in is because my dog woke up in the middle of the night. But anyway. Okay. Um, okay. So let's just talk about the market. And then quickly we'll talk about just how to change buyer offers maybe to, because uh, right now I feel it's based a bit on luck. So. Yeah. I was thinking about this the other day that, you know, our, our uh, strategies as realtors and our value as realtors change depending on what market we're in. And sometimes as a buyer's agent, you know, when it comes to negotiations in the market like this, um, you know, you're not going to be able to do the, the tough negotiations and uh, hold fast and so forth. It's really a matter of finding out what the seller is looking for and trying your best to give more than the competing offers are giving. So that the buyers, the sellers will look at your offer. So, you know, trying to remove as many of the obstacles as possible, make your clients look as great as possible and still protect them. And it's a very different time than when um, there's a huge selection of properties and you're, yeah, it's just always a different marketplace. You're always wearing a different hat as a realtor. So let's talk about that for sure. Okay, well, let's just do the stats first because that's what we normally do. Mm -hmm. so let me bring it up here. Okay, so March 15th, 2021, we're net unconditional sales at 508 already. We're only halfway mm -hmm. through the month compared to 608 last year. Yeah. But yeah, things year. are already ahead by this point. So um, welcome to the Ides of March, by the way. Um, yeah, so 508 versus 608. We only have 100 to go before we reach. Uh, that's going to that's gonna happen within a week, within probably th four days. Yes, so, but last year was COVID. Last year was COVID, yes. So now we're going to be saying that for the next, not, well, for the upcoming next months month. here. And yeah. Um, it's going to be really hard to sort of have any kind of sense of how the stats really, really um, compare to uh, more regular year. Perhaps we should bring up uh, 2019 as well. Okay, for, I'll do that. Yeah. 
Okay, um, new listings though, 621. That's compared to 1,084 last year. So that's good. Um, and I think that's probably more normal, but we're still low on overall listings at 1,329. Yeah, absolutely. So that 621 again is is only at the point of two weeks into the month. So uh, we'll probably be beating that number by the end of uh, uh, 1,084 by the end of this March. I would say handily. Right. The scary part for buyers is that the new listings to pending ratio is 268 to 258. Mm -hmm. So sellers have about a 95% chance of selling their property. Yeah. It is nice to see though, that still the new listings are more than the pendings. Uh, so there are more listings coming on than there are than sales. So it would, um, that number would suggest that we might be increasing inventory over time. That being said, uh, those new listings, uh, you take the pendings, but you also have to look at what's been expired or withdrawn, taken off market. And at that point, you actually end up about even or actually more properties coming off than coming on. So and price decreases. So interestingly, uh, one of my clients um, was interested in a place and it was a half duplex. And then the other half duplex went on the market, it had a different layout and the agent uh, followed up with me to see if we were interested in the other half duplex. And I said, you know, the layout isn't great. Mm. Um, apparently they aren't getting a lot of viewings. So properties like that, like layout is so important to a buyer when they consider. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. When they're considering um, purchasing. So families like to have bedrooms on uh, three bedrooms on one level. Sometimes Leo uh, can affect how the resale value is. You can't just ask what you want for a house. So you do still have to be cognizant that if you're not getting any showings, probably your price is too high. Yeah. So did you see a price decrease there? Not yet, but I'm sure it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, so hope springs eternal and you either hope that in an increasing market, the market will come up to meet your price. If you've overshot the market with your initial price, and I apologize, everyone. I thought it'd be a little quieter. They're putting carpets in downstairs. I thought they'd finished with all their hammering. It's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll cut um, it short, short today. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so, and I'm seeing a lot more um, increases than decreases. I mean, we don't normally see many price increases. And seeing even 18 price increases here. I was watching the hot sheets the other day. I saw all increases, no decreases. Um, it's a really interesting time because people, I, I think, are also listing their homes and then realizing that they've under undersold themselves and are then saying, no, 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 um, I don't want to undersell this. Let's raise the price. Or they've listed and wanting to, um, to generate multiple offers, expecting that they will sell um, above their asking price. And, and what they're actually asking isn't what they're willing to accept. And then something happens. Maybe they accept an offer. It falls through. And uh, before going back to market, they increase their price to match what they believe aligns with the market. So where did you see that price range happening, those price increases? Um, that actually, I didn't really take close note of that. But I mean, most properties are going to be in the, I would say it was, it was a full gamut of townhouses and condos and houses that I saw the changes in. I find it happens in new development. So yeah. often like uh, we'll get an email from a developer. If we've been interested in a property saying, oh, by the way, we're increasing the price by $10,000 tomorrow. And they mm -hmm. get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And developers also will sometimes, you know, they will take, uh, they'll often bring a realtor in or someone to evaluate or appraise the properties before they go on market. And then they put it out to market and suddenly they have maybe more, more interest than they were expecting. And so the initial sales are really brisk. And so they say, wait a second, we could make some more money. And then they actually do an increase right at that point. And there was a, a recent development that I got some clients into. Um, and the early phase was was going great. And, and the uh, developer's agent was saying, you know, we're, we're going to be increasing our prices. Yeah. And uh, I find 
builders are hard to negotiate price with as opposed to people who are buying resale homes. And the reason for that is that uh, resale homes, they're motivated more by emotion. A developer is more motivated by the hard cash that they're paying the bills. And so um, they're less likely to be flexible on their price. Right. We also don't want to show um, in the sales and the comparable sales when we realtors are looking for, you know, what's sold in a complex, we want to see what else is sold and, and look and see if the um, seller has been making any changes to price, because that of course gives us some information that we can use in negotiations. Um, but one of the things they'll do to hide that sometimes is just do a monetary rebate. And I've noticed that before where, you know, in lieu of a price reduction, they'll say the seller will rebate X dollars back upon closing. And that's just something I've been noticing recently. So sometimes there's, uh, it's semantics. It's the same amount of money. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say also what they do is they. Are you going to say uh, something? You're, you're fading in and out, by the way. Okay. They may also say um, uh, they may have like seven units for sale, but they may only have one on MLS. And so, um, and I've had this happen yeah. recently where when I was showing the property, I got an email list of all of a sudden, hey, there's seven other properties. Don't forget to show them, which is interesting right. because the previous realtor who had had that listing didn't do that. So I wasn't aware of those listings when I showed them. Certainly it could have sold like after viewing it yesterday, I realized I could have sold a different unit before based on what I yes. was not. So, yeah. So that's, that goes uh, to marketing communication, right? So bottom line. One, I think one of the big mistakes that a seller or uh, that a buyer can make right now is calling the listing agent. If they're interested in a property, I've had this happen often recently and just understand that when you call the listing agent you are telling them your name you are usually sharing a lot about yourself personally and even and we have to point out we have agency with the seller but for you to call and even tell us that you're interested in the property if you bring an offer in it's not to your advantage well you you're showing your hand yeah what you're doing there is you're showing your hand and um you know, the listing agent, we're professional, but we're not your friend. And, you know, if you want information, we'll share it. And uh, of course, we're looking out for the best interests of the person who's engaged us, which is our seller. And so um, we have to be able to do our best to sell that property. But any information that you share can and will be used against you at the negotiation table, because it's not that we're being the bad guy, but it's our job to share everything you've told us with our seller so that he can make an informed decision. Right. So, so this is one way not to give yourself an advantage. <laughs> yeah. And there's also, there's also people who will call the listing agent and say, Hey, you know, um, I'm not working with an agent and I just want to work directly with the listing agent um, because I feel like I'll save some money that way. And that's usually not the case either. You don't have representation. You don't know what you don't know, what you're missing in negotiations. You don't know what you're not, um, what you're, you, you're, you don't have an agent saying, you know, this, 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 this other agent has missed something and you really need to do this research, this other agent, uh, you know, these sellers, there's just so much you're going to miss out on and it's really not going to save you money. The listing contracts usually state that if there is no other agent involved, the, um, the listing agent will, will get a full commission. That's true, but it's not going to rebate back to the buyer to, sorry, to the seller and save them any money. Um, you might suggest that it means that the seller's listing agent will be more motivated to work with your offer. But um, most of my colleagues and I are pretty professional and we're going to be looking after our seller's best interests. It's not going to make a whit of difference, you know, how much money we're making uh, for your offer versus another offer, for example. Yeah, and I will say um, it's actually... It's funny because now with the new agency rules, because we aren't allowed to give any agency. I mean, if you want to work with me, I'll just take you to another listing. <laughs> right. So when Jane's saying um, no agency, we can't have dual agency. We can't represent two parties for one transaction. So um, what she's saying is, is if you call on one of her listings, she might talk to you and say, I can't provide you any agency. But hey, by the way, there's a property down the road you might want to have a look at. 
And if yeah. you're interested in that one, she probably she can give you agency. She can represent you, and it allows her to actually act on your behalf uh, as long as you don't have interest in that first property. I do find now uh, what's happened is if I have a listing come up and I have a buyer, um, now I have to just list the property. And then um, if the buyer's interested, I have to refer them to another realtor. So really what's the agency has kind of done a 180 from when we got into real estate in 2006. Mm -hmm. So we've gone through three forms of agency since we've been in real estate you and i before we were in real estate the um the actual norm was that there was no agency for buyers only the seller was represented if a buyer came and um wanted to write an offer even if they thought they had their own realtor they were um uh going to be uh actually working with a realtor who was actually working for the seller as well as the listing agent. They that called it sub agency. It was a really strange time to be um, an agent, I guess. Um, but most agents operated as if they actually had agency, and that's why the agency rules were changed to more reflect what was actually happening. But at the time, it was a weird one. Because yeah. people thought they had representation and they didn't. Which is why so, we now have to over disclose. You know, you're gonna talk to an agent, we're gonna say, by the way. I'm representing you or I'm not representing you pretty much right off the bat. And here's a form, please acknowledge it. So on and so forth. Yeah. So we've become more transactional than um, relational, which has turned a lot of people off and it's made it very hard for realtors who generally tend to be really personable people. So, um, but just understand that we are required to have that form filled out and it is an acknowledgement that we have explained it to you. I, I create a little video to go with mine so people understand it right off the bat. Yeah. So, so um, how to make your um, offer more appealing is go in with your very best offer right off the bat. And one of the things I would suggest is there are three prices. Um, this is after talking to a number of realtors across the uh, country. So there's the 50% price. That means you have 50% chance of getting it. That's pretty low if you go into multiple offer situations. So you're not going in there with your first and best offer. You're going in there with maybe the hope that, oh, maybe I'll get it. You know, you're usually new to the process and, you, and you're thinking, I'll go in like maybe below asking or at asking. <laughs> when you say there's three prices, are you saying there's three strategies to pricing, uh, pricing an offer? Okay. The yeah. second one is a 75% chance of winning. And that's where you're going over asking, but you know, possibly you don't have the, the best deposit and maybe you don't have the dates that the seller wants and um, you're not fully meeting their needs. And, and you're, you're kind of like, Okay, well, let's. You're half-hearted. You're, you're rolling the dice, but you you're 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 working with the probabilities. And saying, There's a good chance I'll get this, but I might not. I might not. Yeah. And then the fourth one is uh, your ninety-five percent, or third one is your ninety-five percent one, and that's where you like bringing out the big guns. I am going to go full hog on what I can maximum pay for this. And uh, you look and see how many other offers there are on the property and you bring in your biggest deposit and you think, okay, well this one, I'm, de I definitely have a very good chance of winning. That's my new strategy. What, what's you, well, those are, that's not strategy. That's just information. <laughs> Is your strategy, the big guns? What's your strategy? Uh, well, it depends on the buyer because I find when they first get into the market, if they're, um, if they haven't been in a multiple offer situation, they yeah. are not, they're not prepared often to go in with the big guns right from the beginning. So I had this discussion with some clients. I think I may have mentioned this in a previous episode, but we had a property that we looked at right off the bat. Here's your dog in the background. Um, hello. <laughs> um, Property we looked at right off the bat, it's too bad, you know, they made an offer, they didn't get it, they actually ended up in a backup position, but, um, you know, talking to them later after they did buy a property um, unconditionally, 
above asking price. Um, and they paid way more than they would have paid had they gotten that first property. I said, to them, look, you know, if, if that first property that you offered on, I had said, you know, here's what you have to do. You have to make an unconditional offer way above the asking price uh, with, you know, and just give the sellers everything they're looking for. If you want to win this, you would have said to me, Andrew, we're going to go find a new agent who can actually give us good advice because who's going to trust the agent that's telling you just give the seller everything they want and pay, you know, 60, 70, 80, 150 grand above asking in order to make this work and not have any conditions if you actually want to have a chance at buying this property. Yeah. And uh, in the 95% approach, you're like ready to, you're committed to buying this property in the 75% approach. You're like, you know, I would have paid that when the offer price comes back. Yeah. I so, often, I often see that too, you know, Oh, you would have paid that. Well, why didn't you offer that? <laughs> And if they if they say I would have paid that, but I'm okay with my offer, that's great. But it's nothing worse than hearing someone say, "I would have paid that. Why didn't I offer more? Or I should have offered more." And so I, yeah. I find also like sometimes um, new buyers new to the process say, "How do I know that they're telling the truth?" Yeah, and it's true. How do you know? Um, and some of this is trust, and some of this is actually experiencing. The process where you're told that there's you know seven eight ten fifteen offers and you're told um you know various bits of information what the seller's looking for and uh, you may not trust that information but enough times of going through the offer process and seeing what the property actually sold for uh, you're going to start to trust that information because you you know you're not winning out when you're not trusting that information if you're, well, if you're writing an offer as if you're the only one, uh, when you're told there's five offers, uh, you, you're not going to win. And your chances of winning are going to be 5% every time with that. Well, and also um, how you trust the process is when you lose. And then somebody <laughs> wins <laughs> at a higher price. Well, or Yeah, it's a process of going through and getting the experience of seeing how this works. So Roy is saying even at 100K over asking hasn't been enough with an inspection before the offer with flexible dates. I've had terrible luck. I'm likely going to just up market where there is less competition. Uh, so yes, so you can change your location and you can change your price range. Those are two ways to sort of eliminate competition. But um, And I found right now people are moving a little bit out of the city. Yeah, they're looking further afield for more options. Um, but even if you go up island or further afield, you're still going to find a lot of competition in certain price points. And it may be that you actually have more money in that price point than, uh, than some of the other folks looking at that price point. You'll still be paying m you know, more than asking and being quite competitive if, all, if things continue to, to, to stay the same. Yeah. Using, yeah, that sort of chocolate fountain analogy again you know, things are continue to spread out into the, into the boonies. Uh, there's still a lot of activity out that way. <laughs> into the boonies. Into the boonies. But um, uh, I, I would say too, though, um, you keep hammering at that nail. And if you're um, constantly hammering at that, you know, below 50% chance of winning, your, your probability is you're going to be writing a lot of offers and never getting anywhere. So it's a matter of, you know, again, readjusting to the reality of the marketplace, but it's also a matter, it's a numbers game sometimes and doing everything you can um, again, to give everything like, like Roy was saying, he did what he could you know, above asking over and over uh, uh, giving all the dates and everything. Um, eventually you will get it or the market will shift. Or unfortunately for some, if this market continues, you get priced out of the marketplace. And so the one thing I would also say is uh, sometimes you can win, you can lose by winning and win by losing. Um, but if you're going to, um, in a marketplace where you, know, you look back at the past and say, if I had only offered, you know, that hundred grand above asking, you know, six months ago, I'd actually be sitting on some equity today. And now I'm not, and I'm having to actually offer 150 above asking. Um, and I should preface this all with the fact that 
when we're saying 150 above asking or 100 above asking, a property could be priced above its actual value today, and you'd be silly to offer even a, even asking price. That's still possible, and a property could be you know really well priced, and you have to offer a lot more to get it. So it's really about understanding where the market is right this very instant, and that house in it. Right? Can I comment now? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Roy is saying my fear is paying a higher amount and being in a rougher neighborhood. The thing is what I'm finding is that the neighborhoods are turning over because there's people coming in with more money and then they're uh, investing capital into their house. And so they're changing the neighborhood. Um, and uh, actually I have to tell you, I have to cut this short today because I have to go and do a pre-inspection on a house <laughs> with a client who's going all in. Yeah. But I would say the biggest thing is quite honestly, is have a really good attitude because I think it comes across and there's something to be said about karma. And sometimes the highest price doesn't always win. And you don't know, unless you try, I can guarantee one thing though. If you don't offer, you're not going to win. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Good, good point, Jane. <laughs> okay. So um, next week, we're going to have Trisha Lehan. She's going to be talking about the Arizona market. And for those listening outside of Victoria, just so you know, the craziness is not just in Victoria. It's all over the world right now. Um, I'm part of a group called Realtor, uh, Real Estate Agents Without Borders because all realtors aren't. Realtor is a professional designation. It's not used everywhere. But anyway, this craziness is all over the world because people are moving money from the markets into uh, real estate. So interesting. Okay. Well, that's going to be an interesting one next week. Bring your questions, bring your curiosity. Um, and Jane, did we want to talk anything further about strategies in this marketplace? Um, you know, things like, like we talked before about letters uh, to the sellers, we talked about, um, you know, I've always thought, so one thing I've done recently was I wrote two offers at this for one property. Um, yeah, we wrote one unconditional uh, at asking and one um, one conditional above asking. We presented both because we'd lost out on a property. Um, and that, that strategy actually won us the property. They chose to work with one of those two offers. But, um, you know, it's you break out of what you think is normal and look at maybe changing the rules a bit um, so that you can get yourself, get some attention and get the seller to pay attention to you and notice you. Yeah. So and I think part of that has to do with your, who your realtor is and how well they represent you and just understand that they're the face of you in the transaction. And so you want to be represented in the best possible way. And yeah. I can tell you being on the receiving end as a listing agent, you really want somebody I think who's working both ends of the market because they can tell you the effect of certain things when you're presenting an offer in a buyer situation, because, uh, uh, I have been the receiving party on a bad offer where the agents just kind of thrown the offer. Oh yeah, here. Oh, and then, you know, not paid attention to the details. Just yep. put, put all show your some, best effort. Yeah. Show some care in writing and crafting that offer. Show some care in your uh, presentation of that offer and uh, don't overdo it. I mean, nobody wants to be hounded. And at the same time, don't underdo it. You don't want to just throw an offer in and be silent. So it's a fine line there. But yeah. uh, what Jane was alluding to is we both work with buyers and sellers. So we've worn both hats and we've seen and perceived what it's like to be a buyer making an offer and a seller receiving an offer. So we've and, and be the representative working between those. And so we get to see what 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 works, what really yeah. works. There's a what lot of agents out there. There are some agents out there that work exclusively with listings and they have their team members doing buying, working with buyer's agents. And uh, of course those team members are not, that are working with buyer's agents are not listing properties. So they're not seeing the same bit of information. So maybe one day I'll tell you my secret of how I win offers, but not today. Wow. But stay tuned Tune for next week. week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I really have to go. I have a 35 minute drive and I'm 30 minutes away. I okay. mean, 30, 35 minutes away in a 30, whatever. Just don't speed. Take care. <laughs>
Okay. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next week with Trisha Lehan from Arizona. She's going to be talking to us about her crazy market there. And uh, thanks, Roy, for showing up every week. We really appreciate you. If you guys ever have any questions, please put them in the chat. We do see them and we'd love to respond. And don't forget, send us an email. I'm just going to go up here. If you want to reach Andrew. Andrew at 250-360-6106, phone or text, or email me info at andrewplank.com. And if you want to reach me, I'm Jane Johnson with the Briar Hill Group, 250-744-0775, and you can email me at briarhillgroup at gmail.com. Take care, everybody. See you all next week. Have a great week. Love you, buddy. See what I did there? See you all next week. All y'all. <laughs> all y'all. <laughs> Bye. Bye.